when I worked in revenue, um, I used to get great fun out of starting a talk with I'm from revenue, I'm here to help. Um, I can't use that one anymore. Um, okay, I'm going to go quite quickly through because uh, the earlier speakers, in fact, have laid the groundwork very well, and I'm just going to concentrate on customs and the practicalities of uh, trading across borders. Brexit is unprecedented, it's been said before. Um, the problem with it, and one of the real challenges for business, is that it can't be modeled. So many variables are going to change uh, in ways that we can't accurately predict. Of course, businesses are going to seize opportunities. Some businesses will fail, I think, uh, over the process. Um, Consumption habits will change, social habits will change. As David Carson said uh, earlier, everything is going to change. So you can't really model, you can't really say it's going to affect the Irish economy 4% or 3% of this sector or that sector. It's just going to be a big change. The problems will be resolved. At the end of it, there will be a new dispensation, a new set of arrangements, and life will continue. The real difficulty and where I think we need to focus is the intervening period between now and that future stability, which I think myself is likely to be five, five years at least. In terms of trade, some controls are almost certain. Uh, I put in the almost just in case. Um, there will have to be some controls at the border. I'll come back to that and explain a little more but it will be, um, there will be additional controls, and that will mean additional costs, and some reduced certainty in terms of de delivery times, the time it takes to get uh, a spare part or a, uh, an essential supply in. You won't necessarily be able to operate a just-in-time system. Um, so that kind of uncertainty will be injected in relation to the UK. The reason really is that in the absence of single market controls, and the, the single market, there have been various uh, enormous figures quoted, 11,000 regulations, 750 treaties, all this kind of thing, which go to support the single market. And they operate all around us in our ordinary everyday life. When you're dealing with a country that steps outside the single market, then customs becomes the gatekeeper of all the regulations and the quality control, if you like. And that takes place at the borders, so checks at ports and airports are likely very probable, in fact. And there will be checks of various types. The most vulnerable trade in the Brexit scenario is low margin goods, because you just can't carry the cost of uh, extra procedures. Perishable goods, like seafood, and indeed, Richard mentioned this, uh, lose a day, you may lose your load, if, or you may lose y your market. And just-in-time deliveries. Just-in-time deliveries are a particular issue because quite often it's uh, low volume, maybe even single items, uh, being shipped by van or by truck to the UK or from the UK. If you want to do that in a post-Brexit scenario, you're paying a customs agent 50 euros or more per item. That's not going to be economical. So the idea of just keeping your storage capacity low in your market and supplying it as required is likely to become difficult. The most vulnerable business model, naturally enough, is small, relatively low funds, and the relatively informal markets and businesses, those that simply trade on the basis of you know, you, you load up, you go to your market, you deliver, you come home, kind of thing, uh, where it's all fairly loose, fairly um, um, simple. Uh, that's, that poses challenges. It poses challenges because of new regulations, where, where regulations at the moment are applied by uh, various inspection agencies and so on, quality control, health and safety, all of those agencies 
each of the requirements there will now need to be checked at the border and need to be documented. So an informal business is going to be challenged. And by the way, I'm just for the record, Northern Ireland is a very special case, and I'm not dealing with Northern Ireland in anything I say. I'm simply talking about east-west trade. Northern Ireland is a very special case which would need a summit all of its own. For the seafood trade, and I've got uh, even more juicy statistics for Jim, which unfortunately are different from the previous ones, but I wouldn't worry too much about that because in actual fact we don't really know what our trade with the UK is. It's based on VAT returns and industry census. There's no hard data. So they're approximately, they're in the same ballpark as yours, Richard, so we'll, we'll live with that. Um, what's shown there in terms of imports and exports um, shows a mature and successful export trade. There's no doubt about it. I mean, if you put China and Hong Kong t together, at least according to the United Nations, Richard, we are selling to China and Hong Kong more than we're selling to the UK. Now, I don't know, but that's what they, that's what they say. Uh, so we have a very mature and successful trade um, with many third countries, but we have vulnerabilities then to Brexit. Transit across the UK, which Richard has mentioned, and I'll come back to that, the use of UK intermediate processing facilities. In other words, if you're uh, having fish packaged or breaded or frozen or whatever in the UK, that's a problem. Likewise, if you're providing that service to a UK uh, supplier, that's a problem. Sourcing produce in the UK is a problem. Um, and the reason that these are all problems is that there will be more formality about crossing the border. So you'll have inward processing, outward processing, as they're called in, in customs terms. You'll have the potential for tariffs, although everybody hopes that there won't be tariffs, but potentially it's there. And then, of course, I just put in at the end something that I don't plan to talk about because it's been very well covered this morning is the whole new regulatory and quota and catch arrangements and all of that, of course, is a huge vulnerability for the seafood industry. And I mentioned it for that reason, not because I know anything about that area and I don't plan to talk about it. So planning for solutions. Um, major issues. Uh, I've been talking to industry over the last two or three years about Brexit and what their concerns are. And the major issues are cost and the ability to guarantee delivery time, inwards and outwards. In other words, knowing that your supply chain will work when you need it to. Customs and regulatory requirements are really minimized by advanced planning and prior arrangement. And the example Richard gave of the uh, live lobsters from Canada into China is an outstanding example of what can be done if you plan it carefully in advance. You can get a live lobster from Canada into China in three days, right? Um, and that means meeting all the health regulations, meeting all the, the requirements, Canadian and Chinese, and uh, doing it all in three days shows that uh, a very smooth and efficient supply chain is possible if it's planned. Some issues will pose risks which are more or less, well, they're more difficult to deal with for complex supply chains like port congestion or random checks on one side of the border or the other. Um, and there, uh, it, the port congestion, there are ways of dealing with it but it requires a political framework to deal with that. Random checks, you can minimize by planning, but there still remain risks for complex supply chains. So each business must choose its best supply chain option. Uh, transition period is not yet agreed. It's, it's still likely, but looking a little less likely every day, but it's, it's not yet agreed. And in any case, it's only two years, and two years is not a long time in terms of business development. So we need to start serious planning now. Just to give you a pessimistic example, now I'm not saying that this is what's going to happen, but I'm saying that if you were to apply the rules in a very rigorous way, and if there were to be no special arrangements, you could find yourself with this kind of land bridge experience uh, getting to France. The producer will require the health certificates and so on as required under regulation, under EU regulations. 
and also any additional certificates that the UK may require. But if it's pure transit to France, that shouldn't be an issue. Um, assuming the UK I I is actually part of the European Transit Convention. They say they intend to join, but they haven't made any steps as yet to join, so we'll see. Haulier, uh, the truck driver, the, ha the haulage operator, will have to conform with transport regulations for a third country, UK, uh, which means that uh, they need a permit to have the truck cross the country, operate in the country. Uh, you need recognize recognition of driver permits and there are also the road charges which the UK uniquely imposes on foreign trucks. Uh, no other EU member state does. So there's quite a bit of additional cost and preparation potentially for the whole year. The transport operator, the ferry, has to make safety and security declarations entering and leaving the UK, which means essentially you've got to supply the ferry operator with the information and they then have to file it in advance for safety and security re reasons. The customs agent has to open and close a transit procedure for crossing the UK, which, is, which amounts to a form of customs declaration. Proof of EU status for entering France, because you're going to be in there with a lot of UK trucks, and they're under a different regime, so you've got to prove where your stuff came from. And there is a financial guarantee required to cover that whole procedure in case the shipment goes missing in the UK and fails to arrive at its destination and compensation is due to the UK. On top of all of that, there's the unpredictable risk, possible congestion of ports entering and leaving the UK, which I won't go into in any detail. So it sounds like fun, doesn't it? Choices available are the choices to be made. It's best if all the operators in the chain have AEO authorization and simplified procedures. It's even better if one agency or person takes charge of managing the whole um, flow. Uh, should the producer seek AEO authorization? Should the producer develop customs capability in-house? Well, again, as a previous speaker said, you certainly should learn. The information is online. This is important. Customs is suddenly important again, and trading is important. And if you're interested in trade or indeed in business generally, you should find out as much as you can about Brexit and about customs and about uh, trading. Because we are a trading economy. Brexit is m much more important to us than it is to the UK. And I've spoken in the UK, and I can tell you the audience reaction makes that clear. Foreign trade for them is 45% of GDP. For us, it's 100% or more. Uh, in, depending on which version of GDP you're using, it could be 200%, but I leave that to Jim. Um, Jim is the expert in that. And is your existing supply chain too costly and too complex? Will it, in fact, threaten the survival of your business unless you simplify and uh, react? Authorized economic operator. I put up this slide because I've heard a lot uh, of rumor and gossip, and I've had people come up to me in the street and tell me with absolute authority and unshakable conviction that becoming an authorized economic operator is a waste of time and it costs too much and it's far too complex. There are um, four requirements which are listed there. Uh, the fifth one is if you want to become an AEO for safety and security purposes, which in the food industry really wouldn't make sense. So there are four. You've got to have a record of tax and customs compliance, never a problem for a fisherman. Um, a high level of control in your operations and in the flow of goods. So you need to know where your goods are. You need good stock control and, uh, and good flow. And that has to be capable of being examined by customs from time to time. You need financial solvency, fairly straightforward. And you need practical standards of competency in customs for the staff involved in running the operation. That's what you need. And there is a, a requirement placed on the National uh, Authority Customs in Ireland to reflect the scale of the operation and the size of the business in the rigor with which they examine applications for AEO. In other words, you don't apply the same rules to a huge organization that you do to a very small one. The benefits are very considerable. First of all, 
the financial guarantee that's required for sh shipment can be reduced or in some cases waived. Your business premises can become authorized as a customs warehouse and you can get stuff in with duty suspended, which is very useful. And checks can be carried out there instead of at the border, for certain checks at least. You can uh, centralize clearance as a possibility. Entry and declarance records instead of a customs declaration. In other words, if you're exporting in a hurry, you can, uh, provided you, you have the necessary authorization, simply keep a record of, of what is shipped and deal with the customs later, which can be very advan advantageous. Self-assessment of liability is a possibility. And overall, what you'll find is that all of the simplifications in the Union Customs Code require less checking and have a lower bar if you are an authorized economic operator. So it's very good. Sorry, Jim, I'm leaving now. Uh, the con in conclusion, the uncertainty will continue for some time, and, uh, and there will be a period of adjustment. And I use the word adjustment rather than transition because two years won't do it, in my view. I think it's going to take longer for just attitudes, behaviors, consumption patterns, shipping patterns, business patterns to adjust. But planning ahead is now possible using the known arrangements for third country trade. So you use the known arrangements. The EU is not going to renegotiate the existing EU arrangements. It's just too complex and would take too long. So if you say, well, what do we default to, given all the chaos and, and, and noise that's going on in the UK? Well, you default to how we currently deal with third countries and say, well, at worst, that's going to be it. And if it's better than that, well, that's a bonus. And it's very important to become familiar with possible customs and regulatory requirements and the associated costs and delays. The information is available. There are expert companies um, offering advice. Uh, Revenue offers advice and will talk to people. Um, and indeed, the Revenue website um, and the EU uh, customs website are both very informative. So do start planning now. Thank you very much.